from uh, Princeton University. Professor Poor uh, spent uh, about 14 years uh, with the University of Illinois. Uh, he moved to Princeton in 1990. And at uh, Princeton, he was uh, dean, the dean of the um, uh, School of uh, Engineering and Applied Sciences from uh, 2006 to 2016. Uh, he is a very well known figure in the field of uh, signal processing and information theory. Uh, uh, he uh, is interested in art in this area, uh, in these areas, and uh, uh, also in applications of this field. He is interested in uh, wireless channels, for example, wireless uh, physical products of wireless channels. Sorry. He's interested in wireless networks, energy systems, and related fields. Uh, Professor Poor is a member of the National Academy of uh, Sciences, the National Academy of uh, Engineering. He's also a uh, foreign member of the National, uh, Chinese National Academy and also a member of other national academies. Uh, he has so many, he has so many awards, uh, so I'll only mention two. That's from uh, 2017. So he is a recipient of the IGP Alexander Bernbell Medal and also an honorary degree from Syracuse University. So there we have a presentation. It's like what you see on the screen. And again, uh, I'd like to thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Everybody. Thank you again, Peter, for that nice introduction. Um, very nice to be here. Thank, I know this is the last day of freedom before classes start on Monday, so I really appreciate you taking the time to help us through what I have to say today. Also, it's a beautiful day, so being in here is really not as nice as being out there. Glad you're here. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know if, how many people here are working in wireless networks, but just um, let, me, let me say a little bit about the history of modern wireless, which is basically cellular communications, and I guess Wi-Fi as well, but I'm talking here mainly about cellular communications. Well, the first uh, generation of cellular communications uh, rolled out basically in the mid-1980s, early to mid-1980s, so-called 1B analog voice. And then there's been a new generation every, roughly every decade. So 2G is digital voice and Text, text messaging, SMS. 3G was uh, wireless data. Uh, 4G, wireless streaming. And now 5G, which is what we're working on now, uh, and also people are thinking ahead, also is gonna provide other new, new services. And so what I'm gonna talk about today is uh, some foundational things underlying uh, 5G and perhaps uh, uh, generations beyond. So every generation, probably except the first one, has really benefited from insights from information theory. Uh, you know, the first one was analog voice, it was FM. There really wasn't a lot for information theory to say. But once once wireless went digital, uh, information theory had a, big, a lot to say about it. So I'm gonna today I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, a little bit about what enabled 4G. So that's what we all have now. Uh, and these are all things basically that came from information theoretic fundamentals. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges for what's emerging, 5G and beyond. And I'll say something about some open problems and potential solutions that people are looking at. Uh, then I'm going to talk specifically about two fundamentals, information theoretic fundamentals, uh, that are underlying some of the evolution of wireless networks. One is physical layer security, and the other is finite block length fundamentals, which really applies to short packet communication. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, more about that uh, going forward. So um, let me start out with this, looking at the state of the art, where we are now on your phone today, and some of the challenges for the, the going forward. And here I'm gonna focus on the so-called wireless physical layer, which I'll, I'll explain now. 
So uh, I'm, I'm sure many of you are well aware of this, but uh, for those of you who aren't, let me just say that you know wireless networks are organized into layers. Uh, this is for the benefit of the designers and also the network is uh, able to operate more effectively this way. And you can update the network more effectively this way. Uh, and in the wireless uh, communications, there, there are many layers, but the main ones are these. So there's the application layer, which you can think of as being at the top. That's where we interact with the, the network. So web browsing, voice communications, and so forth, streaming video. Uh, the network layer is under that responsible for moving traffic around in the network, so moving messages from point A to point B. Uh, and then there's multiple medium access control, which is responsible for scheduling messages off the network into the physical medium. So physical medium is where the rubber hits the road, basically it's where data is transmitted. So it's in the case of wireless, it's the ether, wireless transmission. And uh, the physical layer is that part of the network. Okay, so when I talk about physical layer, I'm really talking about the part of the network that uh, corresponds to physics, radio physics, essentially. Uh, and, and the parts of trans data transmission that have to do with that part interfacing with the, the air. So let me say a little bit about uh, how what, what happened in 4G, what's on your phone today, uh, that got us to video streaming, okay? Uh, one is uh, exploiting spatial diversity, okay? So radio waves travel um, uh, like they're broadcast, okay? They, they reflect off of uh, objects, and when you, they're received at your uh, receiver, at a receiver, like your cell phone, uh, they're received in multiple copies, okay? And that provides what's called spatial diversity, uh, and it was learned in 1990, this used to be considered to be an impairment, it's fading, but it was learned in the 1990s that if you use multiple antennas, uh, you can actually exploit that spatial diversity and get greater capacity. And that's one of the big advances of 4G was to exploit spatial diversity. And it's not only exploitable in terms of multiple antennas, but it can also be exploitable using by having multiple street distinct terminals uh, cooperate with one another, or having relays, which is another way of doing the same thing. Okay, so this is a big advance in 4G. Also, exploiting frequency diversity, because uh, in addition to creating spatial, multiple spatial paths, uh, multipath also causes um, uh, differences in uh, receiving quality of different frequencies. And so, uh, OFDM, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, was developed, or it's an old technique, but it was for 4G, and, uh, and this allows us to exploit frequency diversity without a lot of um, uh, complexity in the receiver, hardware complexity in the receiver. And then finally, so all these things are based really on information theoretic ideas. MIMO, the multiple antennas, can be shown using information theory that you can get much greater capacity than you expect, and so forth. Another uh, uh, advanced in 4G was the development of new codes that could approach the so-called Shannon limit. So the Shannon limit of a channel is the capacity, maximum information carrying ability of the channel. And uh, in the 90s, again, uh, turbo codes were discovered, which allows uh, transmission very, very close to the Shannon limit. And that has evolved into other types of codes. Basically, it uses so-called iterative decoding. So, Sophisticated signal processing in the receiver tied with uh, codes that allow you to take advantage of that, and you can get very close to the channel limit. So, all these things allow data rates to be much higher uh, than uh, they were in 3G. So, that's why you can stream on your phone. So, we have the birth of the smartphone, and all of that follows from this kind of physical layer of advances. Okay, what about now? Okay, so um, now what's emerging is uh, so-called 5G, okay, which should be coming out any moment now, probably by 2020. Uh, and so what, is, what are the challenges for 5G? Well, first of all, if you're always challenged to add more capacity, greater reliability. Uh, in 5G, there's also the goal of adding, of creating greater energy efficiency. 
know, this is a new uh, thing, which wasn't such a big deal in other generations of, of wireless. But I'll, I'll explain why in a minute. So one of the reasons why uh, we're interested in energy efficiency is because of new applications. One of the most important ones is the so-called Internet of Things. Today, wireless networks primarily work for people, so, you know, cell phones. Uh, and there's, you know, five or six billion of them, of us. Uh, but the Internet of Things has to do with uh, connecting uh, machines, basically cars, manufacturing machines, uh, appliances in your house. Uh, so there are many, many more of those. So the thing with the Internet of Things is, first of all, hundreds, potentially hundreds of billions of terminals rather than fewer than 10 billion terminals. Uh, they're very dense, okay? So only so many people can be in one area at a time. You can have a lot of machines in the area at a time. And often the terminals are of low complexity, okay? So this is a different paradigm from uh, from the kind of thing we care about with our cell phone. Our cell phone is high complexity. There aren't as many of them. Maybe they're not as densely used as internet of things would require. So another, another major application area in um, uh, 5G is autonomy and telecontrol. So you can think of autonomous driving or other kinds of autonomous things, uh, which have to communicate very rapidly to stay in control, okay? So, whereas voice or internet or any other texting, human-to-human you know, -human communication can tolerate a pretty good bit of delay without any anyone noticing it. So psychologically, we can't we can't really detect really really uh, delays of a certain amount, hundreds of milliseconds. Uh, when you're trying to control a vehicle moving at high speed, you really have to have very very rapid, uh, very very low latency, that is very very quick communication. So it has to be very high reliability. You don't have time really to wait for uh, the research receiver to come come back with a negative acknowledgement that the packet, for example, wasn't received correctly. So low latency, very, very high reliability, and often the packets are very short. That is, the packets of information are very short. It's just something like, um, if it's not a text message, it's some very short command, like turn right, turn left, that sort of thing. Uh, and then finally, a uh, very high performance uh, part of 5G is immersive experiences like a virtual reality, which requires very high bandwidth streaming, even, even higher than what you would have for, say, watching a video on your cell phone. So these uh, challenges drive some uh, potential solutions, create some problems, and of course, people have been working on solutions to these problems. So, for example, uh, with the Internet of Things, densification is a big issue, and inter interference is a huge issue because you have many, many more terminals. There's just not enough spectrum to give each terminal its own uh, individual channel. So there have been a number of ideas uh, that have been proposed and are being developed for 5G to deal with this. One is the so-called cloud radio access network, CRAN, where the terminals, uh, the, the, the um, radio, so-called radio heads, that is the part of the network inter interfaces with the radio uh, is very simple and it just digitizes the signals it receives and uploads them to the, the cloud where all the sophisticated signal processing is done. Okay, so this is one way of moving complexity into a place where you have a lot more computing power. Massive MIMO, which is another a form of MIMO, which has instead of eight antennas, it has hundreds of allows uh, much greater isolation of individual terminals and many, many individual terminals. It also takes some of the randomness out of the radio channel. Uh, moving up to higher frequencies, so today cell phones are at microwave frequencies. Uh, up at millil millimeter wave, there's a lot more spectrum available. And also, uh, it's much, much more amenable to densification because millimeter waves generally don't really propagate as far. Uh, before they're attenuated. Uh, antennas at millimeter wave can be very directional. So there are a lot of reasons why millimeter wave is, is useful, and technology is now allowing uh, cellular type communications to move into millimeter wave bands. Uh, energy harvesting, uh, Edgar and I were just talking about that this morning. It's another uh, 
technologies being developed where you have many terminals uh, and the Internet of Things, the terminals may not be in places where you want to change. You're able to, to power them by additional maids. You may not want to be changing 100 billion batteries. So uh, another way to power terminals is using energy harvesting. That is, they can harvest their ambient radio energy uh, in order to power their own transmissions or their own signal processing. Or you can have directed uh, energy bearing signals directed at terminals that can then allow them to harvest energy. Uh, for capacity enhancement, there are a number of other uh, techniques being developed. One is full, so-called full duplex uh, transmission. So today, most most transceivers are half duplex. That is, they can only transmit or receive. They can't do both at the same time. But full duplex is, is a technology that's now being developed. So where where same, the same transmitter and re receiver uh, pair can uh, transmit and receive at the same time. Okay. So Called full, full duplex uh, is a technology that's being enabled by again some technical advances in antennas and other things. The big problem, of course, is suppressing the the, 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 the interference from the, the transmitter at the same receiver, which could be very very close compared to the transmitter that the receiver is trying to to receive. But uh, there are uh, this is a technology that, that is promising and is being developed. So that doubles the capacity. You can get the full duplex. Probably won't get all the way to full duplex, but you can certainly increase the capacity. Another uh, technique is NOMA, non orthogonal multiple access, which is take, takes advantage of again of some physical uh, di physical distribution of receivers in a given cell, so that to, to superimpose signals on top of one another uh, from multiple receivers and uh, allows advanced signal processing again to actually multi user uh, to separate the signals out of the receiver. So this is another very promising way. So in doing that, you can put multiple signals in the same part of the spectrum uh, without undue interference, and that allows you to get additional capacity. And then another, another uh, issue of this big, another technique that's being developed is caching, forward caching, or pro, so-called proactive caching, where content is transmitted forward in the network to the edge of the network. Uh, during times of low uh, demand, so like at night, for example. And then the content has already been pushed out to the edge of the network when, uh, when it's needed. So that, that saves, uh, basically saves bandwidth. It doesn't really create capacity, but it just levels out peak capacity uh, so that it, you, can, you can make better use of the capacity that's there. Of course, here there are a lot of issues like what content do you push that sort of thing, but there's a lot of research going on in that area. Uh, two other areas I'm going to talk about a bit more are security and the Internet of Things, and I'm going to talk about so-called physical layer security. I'll explain that a bit more. Uh, and then also short packet transmission, that is the fundamentals of finite block link communications. And that's Victor Claude Shannon. I'm going to talk about these in information theory terms. So that's a, basically premise of the rest of my talk. Well, let me say a little bit about physical layer security before I go on, uh, but about security and IoT before I go on to talk about physical layer security. Uh, so there are many, many devices. They're low complexity. The network may be fairly, uh, have fairly light infrastructure. So there may not be a trusted party who can share secret key with all these different terminals. Also, the terminals, if they're low complexity, they may not be able to do the computations necessary for, say, public key cryptography. So, um, traditional types of uh, security, data encryption, not, is not necessarily, not necessarily practical for the Internet of Things. Okay. Also, uh, latency is important, right? So, cryptography has latency or decryption has latency. So. Uh, it's interesting to look at other types of security, uh, ways of securing uh, data transmission uh, when we're looking at the Internet of Things. So that sort of motivated what I'm going to talk about next. And then I'll come back and motivate a bit a second later. Okay, so let me talk now about physical layer security. Um, so, first of all, I, I already mentioned that you know one of the big advances of 4G was improved, uh, was basically 
exploiting uh, the physical layer. And that particular aspect of the physical layer was the spatial diversity afforded by reverberations in the channel. Okay? Uh, and so, as I said before, we thought of the, when I was studying communication in the beginning, we always thought about these things as impairments. So they make the signal fade, and we don't like that. And in fact, in 1G, uh, analog voice, fading was a huge problem. Everybody who was alive then uh, would know that you often drop the signal and you fade in and out. So, so we turn that into a friend. From the uh, also, cognitive radio, which I didn't mention before, which is opportunistic use of the radio spectrum as it's being vacated by other uh, terminals, or other transmitters and receivers, uh, allows us to exploit the so-called diffusive nature of wireless communications. If you're far enough away from an active transmitter, uh, you can use that spectrum uh, again. Cognitive radio. So these allow us to use the physical layer in ways that give us additional performance. So what about security? Okay, so security again is traditionally a higher layer issue in the application layer, data encryption, or perhaps in the layer slightly below that, so-called presentation layer. So that's really the traditional way of providing uh, data confidentiality. Okay. As I said before though, encryption can be complex and it can be difficult to implement without enough infrastructure. So another approach to security and wireless is to think about how the, the physical layer, that is the radio physics, might be able to provide some level of security. Okay? And information theoretic security is sort of the fundamental science of that, of that uh, issue. Okay? And that's what we're talking about now. And I'll just point out that I'm talking primarily here about secrecy, that is data confidentiality. There are a lot of other layers of security. Uh, but I'm going to talk mainly probably primarily here about data confidentiality. But there are there is work in information theory approaches to other types of security, okay, like authentication, for example. Okay, so uh, so little history lesson. Uh, so information theoretic secrecy goes back to Shannon, 1940s, Claude Shannon, uh, who studied uh, this type of system we see here. So we have a message. Alice transmitter wants to transmit that message to Bob in confidential, confidentially, okay, reliably and in confidence, keeping it secret from an eavesdropper we'll call Eve. Okay? Uh, Alice and Bob share a secret key. So this is a cipher system. Uh, and so Shannon was interested in the question of when uh, what properties of the key and the message need to have in order for Alice to be able to transmit the perfect secret. Bob. Uh, and in this model, there's no noise. Everybody, Bob and Eve, see exactly what Alice transmits, and I'll come back to that point in a minute. But the secret key allows, it, 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 so the secret key is basically the mechanism that allows for uh, perfect uh, secrecy, potential perfect secrecy. And Shannon showed uh, here that there's, there's basically good news and bad news. The good news is, that in this setting, you can transmit perfect secrecy. But the bad news is that this, the uh, key, you know, the necessary condition for perfect secrecy here is that the key of the, the key has to have at least the same entropy, that is, randomness, as the source. Uh, so H is just a symbol for, for entropy. And uh, so that's, that's the good news and bad news, because it does mean we can transmit the perfect secrecy in the presence of the eavesdropper. But the bad news is to do that, we have to use a one-time pad. Okay, so-called one-time pad, meaning uh, you have as much randomness in the key as you do in the source. Uh, now, this was okay in Shannon's day, in the 1940s. Shannon was mainly interested in radio telephone systems, where the key was was, was basically taken physically on a, on a recording uh, by a person with a, a briefcase strapped to their or handcuffed to their wrist uh, from the transmitter to the receiver. So it was okay because you had a back channel. To send the secret key. Now, if you're using wireless, if you have to transmit the secret key by wireless, you need the same resources to transmit the secret key in secrecy that you need to transmit the source itself in secrecy, so it's not a very practical thing. So, modern encryption systems do not use one-time pass. They use a smaller 
bit of randomness that's expanded into a key, and they take advantage of computational uh, problems that are very hard to solve uh, to, to ensure secrecy. Those are not secure in this, in this way. They're not really information driven. They're only secure as long as quantum computers uh, don't exist. Okay, things like that. Um, so what? So this is 1949, uh, and uh, move forward about 25 years. Another model for uh, information theoretic secrecy is due to this guy, Aaron Weiner. But by the way, both of these people were working at Bell Labs at the time. And, and Aaron Weiner uh, introduced what's called the wiretap channel. Okay, and so the wiretap channel, you, have, you still have Alice, Bob, and Eve, but uh, Weiner looked at the more practical situation where you actually have noise in the communication system. We know that all communication systems really have noise. So he said, let's put a noisy channel, different noisy channel, between uh, Alice and the two receivers and get away from get away, do away with the secret key. So there's no shared secret now, there's just noise. Uh, and what, what Weiner looked at was trying to trade off the rate at which Alice could transmit reliably to Bob versus the so-called equivocation at E, which is a measure of randomness of the source after E has uh, observed her observation Z. Okay? So equivocation is just a name for conditional entropy. So this equivocation really is just the amount of randomness left in the source after E has made her observations. Okay. And so what you'd like the libel rate R to be large and the equivocation of H also to be large. Okay. And you get secrecy, perfect secrecy, when the rate of Bob is equal to the equivocation of E. So Weiner described what he called the secrecy capacity of a channel like this as the maximum rate, reliable rate, such that the reliable rate equals the equivocation at E. Okay. Weiner also had good news and bad news. He showed that the secrecy capacity of the wiretap channel can be positive, but only if Z, that is the E's observation, is degraded relative to Bob's observation. So somehow Bob has to have a better channel than E. So you might think about that if Bob has a higher standard. So again, good news, bad news. All right, well now that was still ancient history. This was 1975, 43 years ago. Um, but because of some of the things I mentioned earlier, there's been a resurgence of interest in these ideas uh, in the context of emerging wireless networking uh, paradigms. Okay. So just in general, if you look at Shannon's model, uh, there's an advantage the, the, the legitimate receiver has the advantage of the eavesdropper in knowing the secret key. And in Weiner's model, the uh, receiver has an advantage over the eavesdropper in having a better channel. Okay? And, and really, to, get, to transmit data confidentially, somehow the legitimate receiver has to have some advantage over the eavesdropper. Otherwise, it's impossible. Right? So it's kind of a, uh, a theorem. Right? So, but it turns out that the physical properties of radio propagation, mainly diffusion and superposition, provide opportunities for this. So first of all, fading, the same phenomenon that allows us uh, to use spatial diversity to get greater capacity, provides natural degradedness over time. So it's possible to take advantage of that with proper coding to secure uh, a channel like the wiretap channel. Interference. So interference is caused by superposition and at, at the receiver, and that allows you to do active countermeasures. So you could degrade a receiver by using um, jamming, for example. So you can degrade an eavesdropper just by jamming the eavesdropper. Spatial diversity. Okay, so if you use multiple antennas and relays, uh, there are ways to create secret, so called secrecy degrees of freedom that allow you to transmit. Secrecy and the presence of the problems. Okay. And then finally, uh, if you want, if you don't like Weiner's model and you prefer Shannon's model, there are also ways of distilling key from randomness in the channel. So if the two, the transmitter, Alice and Bob, share some something random, they can both observe it, 
and uh, you steal a secret key from that that can't be observed by, by E. I'll talk about that more a bit later. I'm just going to point out a survey here if you're interested in learning more about the tail. If you're the city of the National Academy of Sciences last year, he talks about some of these issues. So I'm not going to talk a lot in depth about the detail, but just a uh, more more detail. <coughs> so, you know, wireless networks are a lot like organic chemistry. Um, you know, in organic chemistry, you learn all these small bonds, the properties, and that allows you to understand very complicated organic molecules. So wireless networks are like that too. When we study wireless networks, uh, we study small little networks, okay? Uh, and understanding those helps us understand what happens in, in broader networks. So the issue of uh, physical layer security or information theoretic security, if you wish, uh, has been studied in recent years, the last decade, uh, for all the major element, elemental uh, channel models of wireless uh, communication. So broadcast channel, which is uh, just a generalization of the wire, uh, wiretap channel where you have one transmitter and multiple receivers. Uh, in the broadcast channel, you can think about each receiver as being an eavesdropper for the other receiver. Okay? And so uh, you can think about situations where you have multiple messages, some of which are broadcast to everyone, so like multicast messages, and some of which are intended only for certain uh, receivers. So think about a content distribution system where you have some content you send to everybody and some premium content you only send to certain receivers. Multiple access channel where you have multiple transmitters and a single receiver. Multiple access channel and sort of classically doesn't worry too much about one of the transmitters eavesdropping on the other. But when you think about secrecy, you may not, if you're, you have two terminals or multiple terminals transmitting, say, up to a base station or an access point, uh, they may not want each other to hear each other's communications, right? So you can, you can think about each of the terminals there, in this case the transmitting terminals, is also being uh, eavesdroppers on the other signal. So that's another problem that's been studied in depth. Interference channels, where you have multiple transmitters and multiple receivers. Again, uh, interesting problems there. The interference, the, the actual capacity, not the secrecy capacity, but the channel capacity, the broadcast and multiple access channels are known classically. Uh, the interference channel is still open, so even the uh, channel capacity of the interference channels is not known. But it turns out for some, um, some, some configurations, we can actually determine the secrecy capacities of uh, interference channels. Relay channels, where you have relays out there that are helping the transmission of a legitimate receiver. Uh, you can also look at the implications of that for physical layer security, both when the relay sh relays are trusted, so you, you can rely on them to decode the, the, legitimate, the legitimate receiver's message and relay it on, or when it's untrusted, that is, you don't want it to know what you're transmitting. Okay, so there's two different problems there. And then multiple antenna channels, MIMO channels. Uh, when you have multiple antennas, you can start isolating uh, parts of the air that allow you to transmit it securely without rate penalty. So I say that because normally, in order to get secure transmission, you have to use some of your radio resources to confuse the eavesdropper. So it drops, so the actual secrecy capacity is typically lower than the, the channel capacity of a, of a given channel. Anyway, so this is all, if you look at the survey paper I, I mentioned, uh, all these things are talked about in the depth there. Um, you can also generate key, okay, rather than trying to use physical layer to actually hide messages, you can use it to generate key. So there, this goes back even almost 25 years, because it is 25 years now, to work in the early 90s, where it was shown that even if, if you have a feedback channel, even if the eavesdropper can see the feedback channel, it's possible for two terminals to generate secret key from common randomness. A type of com common randomness occurs because the, the, the radio channel between the receiver and the transmitter is random. But if it's reciprocal in radio transmission, the channel from one direction is the same as the channel from the other direction. So both of the transmitter and the receiver can see the same 
random quantities, and they can use that to distill the secret key, whereas the channel to an eavesdropper would be random, of course, as well, but a different channel. So the eavesdropper can't see the same channel that a legitimate receiver can see. So that allows you to, to distill secret key. Um, and also relays can be also be used to uh, help distill key. Um, if that's, these all work, if you have a passive eavesdropper that's only listening, uh, if you have an active eavesdropper, that is one that actually injects its own signal into the channel, uh, then you have really the only technique for uh, key generation for kind of randomness is channel responsive. So that can still be used even in that case. I'll point out a survey here of this area, which appeared in the, well now it's 2015, so three years ago, which talks about the distilling of these keys. And I think, I don't know if these slides are going to be available, but So this is a very rich area. Physical air security uh, is built around information theoretic principles. It ties to a lot of other aspects of wireless networking. Coding theory, because once you have a capacity region, you need to design codes that, that can uh, achieve the points in that region. So there's a lot of work on what's so called wiretap codes and other kinds of codes for uh, physical air security. Uh, cryptography, because uh, well, it's one way of generating key and managing key, so it ties to that as well. Game theory, because it's adversarial, you have an adversary eavesdropper, so uh, sometimes you can model the behavior of eavesdropper uh, using game theory. And then networking, because again, once you have, in the physical layer, once you have capacity, um, the, the MAC, the medium access control, needs to uh, schedule messages down into the physical layer. So how you do that also is tied up with the sort of core of physical layer security. I'm going to talk about just a couple of uh, recent results in this area, and I'll just do this briefly, then I'll move on to the next topic. But um, you know, one thing you can do is you can think about using, even if you have secret keys, so even if you have a traditional encryption system, uh, you can still take advantage of the physical layer. And this is a paper that appeared in the Transactions on Communications uh, earlier this year, uh, in which you have a, pro a broadcast channel. So you have Alice and two legitimate receivers. I'll call them Bob 1 and Bob 2. And then there's an eavesdropper Eve in the channel. And there, there are two secret keys. So Alice shares a different secret key with Bob uh, 1 and then with Bob 2. So I'll call those key 1 and key 2. Uh, and the question is, and, and then of course there's the eavesdroppers, so there's the physical channels. The eavesdropper receives a different, uh, has a different channel than the two bobs, okay? So one thing you can do would be just encrypt them. You have a message, you want to send it to both of these two, they have different keys. So you can just encrypt the message with each of the two keys and transmit it out there. And then each, each of the general receivers can pull that out of the air using its own secret key. But the problem with that is then you have to double the radio resources to do that, right? You have to use half the radio resources for key one, another half for key two. Okay, so that's, that's, that's a fallback position, but we can beat that by using physical air security. So I'll just show an example. This is for the so-called additive white galaxy noise channel, where uh, you see each of these receivers' signal is corrupted to additive white galaxy noise, thermal noise. Uh, and if, if Eve is strong, as if the eavesdropper is the strongest receiver, so everybody has the highest signal to noise ratio of the three receivers, then we really can't use physical air security. Miner's already told us that. And so um, all we can do is divide the capacity in half and send, use half of it for uh, Bob 1 and half of it for Bob 2. Okay, so that's sort of represented in this example by that line. But then if Eve is in the middle, that is one of the receivers is stronger than Eve and the other is weaker than Eve, we can start using wiretap coding, okay? Actually, it's a superposition of wiretap coding and, uh, and direct encryption of things, decipherment. Uh, and then as if, if Eve is the weakest receiver, then we can continue to use wiretap coding until we get to the uh, secrecy capacity, okay? So this just shows that even though you have secret key, uh, you may not be able to use it as effectively as you can by, 
by combining it with physical layer security. Just an example. Uh, another example is in massive MIMO systems when you have, uh, again, hundreds of antennas, the transmitter. Uh, well, in this case, because you have so many antennas, uh, you can get very, very sharp beams to individual receivers. And so if the eavesdropper is out of the channel, uh, it's going to have a lower chance of uh, receiving the signal. Uh, so it's going to be heavily degraded is the way to think about it uh, as the number of antenna elements goes up because the beam gets sharper and sharper and sharper and more deterministic okay, as the number of antennas goes up. So as the base station, so this just shows basically uh, what happens when you, let, when you increase the number of base station antennas. So for a small number of antennas, so basically the line okay, at the top is the asymptotic secrecy rate okay, in this particular case. Okay. So that's like the, you might think that being like the secrecy capacity uh, as the number of antennas goes to infinity. Uh, and then uh, you have, um, uh, and the red and green lines, are, you don't need to distinguish between those really. These are basically showing the achievable, reliable rate at the receiver versus the number of base station antennas. And then the, the, the purple line, the dash line, dash line at the bottom, is showing the information leakage to an eavesdropper, all versus the number of base station antennas. So, you, and the difference between those is sort of the secrecy capacity, if you will, or the, or the uh, amount of reliable uh, information you can transmit the secrecy. So you can see that for small numbers of antennas, there's really not much gap, right? So you can't do much. But as you get massive in the number of antennas, hundreds, uh, basically you can completely degrade the eavesdropper and, and not worry about the eavesdropper. This is just another example of a sort of more modern system in which physical air security can be applied. Okay, so I want to use the rest of the time talking about finite block uh, fundamentals. So let me let me motivate that. So um, I'm not sure I said this before, but um, I think I did mention it that you know a lot of the communications in, in many applications is short packet. Okay, so in, uh, in automation, for example, you have very short packets that is messages are short, partly to minimize latency, but you also want high reliability. So an interesting interesting questions come up in terms of what's the best reliability you can get for a, for a short packet. Okay. Now, that's not a problem that Shannon addressed. Shannon, in Shannon's work, that I'll talk about a little bit here, he looked at the so-called infinite block leak problem. That is, when you have as much time as you want to transmit a message, how well can you transmit it? So the Shannon capacity is really for infinite block leak codes. Okay. So what about short block leak? So that's, that's a question that we do not want to address now. Okay. So here's a, probably the most fundamental problem of communication. You have a source which has m, take one of m possible values. Uh, it's encoded to be used on the channel, and you encode the source into a vector x with n uh, components, each corresponding to a use of the channel. So this is a channel where we have n channel uses to, sub to send one of m possible values of the message. Uh, that goes through the channel, it's corrupted in some way, noise, something else. Uh, and out comes another vector of length n, the receive vector. There's a decoder. The decoder uh, takes that receive vector and tries to recreate the value of the source. Okay. So we think about the, the code that we're using is the so-called n m epsilon code. You have m possible values for the message. You use the channel n times, and you want to recreate this source with uh, error probability less than or equal to epsilon. Okay, so probability that the received, the decoded message doesn't equal the transmitted message should be less than or equal to some small number of epsilon. Okay, so this is in the method code. And a fundamental limit of any communication system like this is the maximum size that you can have for M uh, for such that there's an in the M epsilon code. So you, you fix a channel, has some physical properties, and you want to know what's the map for a given uh, channel, a given number of channel uses, and a given degree of fidelity. What's the maximum value of M that I can achieve? Okay, and that's that's the 
capacity of the channel, basically. Log 2 of m is the number of bits in the source. That tells you how many bits you can transmit with reliability epsilon in the n-channel basis. Okay. This is a fundamental problem posed by Shannon. And he looked at the situation where the, the number of channel uses goes to infinity. So this is, again, the infinite block in the case. And epsilon, the fidelity goes to zero. So that means uh, it's, it becomes perfectly, the reception becomes perfect, so reliable transmission. Okay. And one of the basic results of Shannon from the 1940s is that communication channels have a, a capacity, which is the limit as uh, n goes to infinity, epsilon goes to zero of the log of this fundamental limit, m star, uh, over n. So this, it goes to, to a constant at rate n, and that rate is the so-called capacity of the channel C. It determines the maximum carrying capacity of the channel in terms of data transmission. And this, this very simple idea has really dominated the development of wireless networks and other networks for for the intervening decades. Now, this has been very important in sort of development of previous networks, but today when we're talking about uh, things like short packet communication, what does this really tell us, right? N is not infinite, it's not even that long maybe, and epsilon may not even be zero. Okay, we may, we may want epsilon to be, we may want to allow some distortion in the packet. Okay, so what are, what is the corresponding result for these uh, the non-asymptotic case. So what if we have finite in epsilon, finite epsilon meaning not, not going to zero? Well, this is, a, this is a question that's captivated a lot of people over the years, including some of the big names of information theory, Shannon, Feinstein, Gallagher. A number of bounds have been developed, even going back you know, to the 1950s, 1960s. Uh, also, Strassen developed an approximation for this result in the 1960s for so-called discrete memorialist changes. So in more recent times, about 15 years ago, uh, sorry, 10 years ago, uh, graduate student at Princeton, Yuri Polyansky, developed some sharper bounds and was able to show that for a very wide class of channels, the, the log of the maximum number of symbols, of symbol values, the number of bits source is uh, n, the number of channel uses, times the capacity uh, minus um, a correction term, which I'll mention in a minute, plus some higher order terms. Okay, so you can see that if you divide by n, this term, which is root, is going to go to zero, a higher order term is going to zero, and everything else is just the capacity. Okay, so that's, that recovers Shannon's result. Now, the, the, the capacity, if you know your information theory, is the expected value, the statistical expectation of so-called information density, I of x, y, which I can put up a formula with, trust me, uh, evaluated at the optimum input distribution and corresponding optimum output distribution. That's okay, so the expected value of mean of that random quantity. And the next term depends on the variance of that same random quantity is called, called the dispersion. Okay. So you can see that we can actually, if you fix n and epsilon, you can actually, to ignore the higher order term, you can actually get an idea of the information carrying capacity of the channel, uh, even for finite n and epsilon. How, how good is this? Uh, here's an example. This is, again, the additive white Gaussian noise channel, where epsilon is 10 to the minus third and the signal-noise ratio is 0 dB. Uh, so the actual capacity, that is Shannon's capacity, and the block length capacity is a half of this particular channel. And this shows uh, the uh, Polyansky's lower and upper bounds. The lower bound is the achievability bound, the upper bound is the converse bound, uh, and an approximate, a Gaussian approximation to the capacity. And you can see that it versus the block length. Okay, so you can see even for a block length of 2,000, there's still a gap in capacity. But for small block lengths, for sending short packets, there's a big gap in capacity, right? And we don't know exactly what the capacity is, but we know it's between those two bounds. So it's bounded well away from the actual capacity. So if we're working to try to achieve Shannon capacity with short packets, we're not, we're not going to get there. This does tell us where we can. 
So just some applications. We can analyze codes now, not based on um, jamming capacity, which is where they're going to fail, uh, or unless they have really, really long clock lengths. We can, we can analyze them relative to the actual capacity, or at least an approximation of the actual capacity. So that allows us to look at shorter codes and to see uh, how they perform versus uh, actual capacity. Uh, we can also look at, look at things like ARQ. So ARQ means uh, uh, basically repeat, adaptive repeat requests where you send a packet and if it's received correctly, you get an acknowledgement. If it's received incorrectly, you get a negative acknowledgement. So you might have to retransmit the packet. So the trade off between the error rate and the length of the packet. Okay, the, the, the longer the packet, you can get a lower error rate, but then uh, if you have to retransmit, you have to transmit more resources. So you can look at the trade off in ARQ by looking at uh, epsilon versus n and choosing an optimal point for length of ARQ packets. Um, another uh, problem we can look at, which is important today, is looking at the trade off between energy and spectral efficiency. So I mentioned that. 5G, we're interested in energy efficiency. And we use, so this is just an example. This is from a Globecom table from a couple of years ago. But if you look at the Shannon limit, you get one trade off. But if you start looking at uh, short packets, so this is a 16 bit packet, uh, and look at higher uh, uh, error rates going up, okay, you can see that the trade off is quite different. Okay, so if we're trying to use Shannon's capacity to design a system. Trade off spectral energy efficiency, we're going to find it doesn't work like we expect. Uh, we can also look at security for short packets. Uh, the WARTAP channel, uh, as I mentioned, is a model for uh, secure communication. Uh, and we can look at the secrecy capacity, which is a Weiner's notion of capacity for a given WARTAP channel. This is a particular one called semi deterministic, going to the details. But basically, you can see again for secrecy capacity, you have the same kind of thing. That is, uh, for, for finite block lengths and for small block lengths, there's a big gap from secrecy capacity to the actual potential capacity. So if you're starting to design wiretap codes for short packets, then you uh, basically uh, should compare with the finite block length capacity rather than the uh, full Weiner type secrecy capacity. Uh, and this is just another example. This is the Gaussian wiretap channel. You can see the bounds are looser here, so this is exactly the problem we're still working on. But you can still see that there are gaps in capacity, even if you look at the upper bounds. Okay, well, I see I have about five minutes left, so let me just wrap up and I'll have you take questions if we have time. Uh, so, what have I talked about today? First of all, I talked a little bit about 4G, how we got there. Okay, what kind of uh, advances led us to 4G? Uh, talk a little bit about 5G. What are some of the challenges? So, densification, uh, low latency, high reliability transmission, short packets, uh, high data bandwidth, and so forth. I talked about potential solutions: cloud radio access, massive MIMO, a millimeter wave, energy harvesting, and so forth. Uh, and then I talk in more depth about two fundamental approaches based on information theoretic principles, namely physical layer security. And finite block length fundamentals. So with that, I'm happy to take questions. Can we use multiple antennas to create some intensity in the direction that we go to Don't you need to have some communication? Because you can hold it. That, that's a very interesting point. So that's the authentication question, right? So uh, if, if you can't authenticate the, the legitimate receiver, you're in trouble, right? So there are another. I, I'm only talking here about data confidentiality. So there are also physical layer approaches to authentication. Uh, they use, for example, the, the, the signal. So you need every every transmitter has a certain peculiarity that has, has a signature, and you can use that to once you know that a receiver, uh, that a transmitter is uh, legitimate, uh, so you may have to do some other kind of authentication first, then you know what its signature looks like, and it really can't be duplicated by another transmitter. So there's a way, that's another type of 
using physical properties to authenticate the, the, the transmitter. And then, of course, the transceiver, so you also authenticate the receiver. Um, but you're right. I mean, authentication is another issue. Right? Digital signature is another issue. So I'm really here only talking about data confidentiality, but people are looking at some of these, some of these issues. It's a good point. Yeah. Uh, regarding the example, we have two bombs, uh, the blind. Uh, one E. Yes. yes. For that one. So when they increase the capacity, mm -hmm. it seems that we need to know the writer E is stronger or weaker. Yeah, okay. That's, that's, that's a really good point. Let's go back to that. Yeah. Okay, so what is that? Okay, so yes, you're absolutely right. How do we know when E is weaker? Okay, so there are two things I'll talk about. One is, he may not necessarily be a, a malevolent actor, right? He, he might be another terminal in the same network, right? So, you know, I gave the example of uh, multicast and unicast. So you have, you're distributing content to a whole network. Some of them have paid for premium content. So they're all out there. You know the, you know the terminals, you know the which is so called channel state information of the terminals. And you want to you want to hide information from Eve, not because she's a level up, but just because she didn't pay for the premium content. So she's part of the network, not, not an enemy. Okay, so in that case, it's okay, right? Now what about when Eve is an enemy, a malevolent actor? Well then you can't really use uh, the channel state information to Eve, okay? But you can use um, sort of if, if you know it's a fading channel, you can use sort of statistical aspects of fading to design codes. The codes won't achieve the same, they won't achieve capacity, but they can still, you can still achieve positive secrecy rate, even if you don't know the channel state to be. Okay. So um, in that case, you have to sort of take a point and, and transmit it, right? Um, so you can, you can assume that uh, in, in the case of the fading channel, this is a static channel added by across added white gas and noise. In the case of the fading channel, what's happening is the fading is changing over time, so there'll be some time when Eve is. Sometimes you're down here, Eve is stronger, sometimes you're up there, right? So you have to use that on sort of on average. You, you encode over multiple blocks, and then on average, you can take advantage of the fact that sometimes you're going to be uh, in one part of this curve, and sometimes you're going to be in other parts of this curve. Again, you're not going to hit the point of the curve, but you'll hit something better than just this flat part here. So that's an excellent question. Other questions? I have a question. Uh, if you can comment on uh, settings uh, that are dynamic when the channels change all the time. Yeah. Okay, the so, what, so, what do you do that? Yeah, so channel dynamics is actually important in uh, using fading, right? Because if everything is fixed, then the fading is fixed, static, right? So you're not going to be able to take advantage of fluctuation. So with mobile, mobile, mobile receiver, the, the fading is going to fluctuate, and that's and what I was talking about. Sometimes the eavesdropper is going to have a better channel, and sometimes the, the intended receiver is going to have a better channel. And that's what you can take advantage of. That's how you can take advantage of fading, even if you don't know which channel is better than you. So mobility is actually an important aspect of that. Yeah. Yes. Great. Well, what was the photo? Okay. Okay. Thanks again. Thank uh, you all.